Hello, my name is Hay. I am a junior doctor working in Nordium University Hospital. In this video, I'm going to talk about fever. Fever is quite a common symptom that patients present with. And the list of differential diagnoses can be hugely extensive. In this video, I will try my best to go through the process of clinical assessment and investigations to demonstrate how we can narrow down our differentials and get to the correct diagnosis. To start off, we will define what fever is. Fever is elevation of core body temperature, generally above 38 degrees Celsius, which is often measured from tympanic membrane in adult patients. Usually, Body temperature is regulated by hypothalamus, and anything that can disturb the normal functioning of hypothalamus can theoretically cause fever. We do know that a variety of chemical mediators can induce fever, such as interleukins, tumor necrosis factors, and prostaglandins. These factors are usually released when there are circulating microbes or microbial toxin or tissue injury or inflammation. And so fever can be caused by both infective and non-infective processes. This is a visual representation to simplify the process approach to a febrile patient. First, we have to think about all the causes of fever and then ask about details on the fever and associated symptoms. And then we do power system review and find out what the cause might be. The big question here will be, is this infection? And then we'll have to ask about the effects of fever as well, which are usually related to dehydration because body loses fluid in the attempt to normalize raised body temperature and then the complications of the underlying condition, which brings about the fever in the first place as well. So we come to the causes of fever, which I already alluded in the previous slide. Infection is the first thing we'll have to rule in or out because it's mostly potentially treatable with the right antimicrobial agents. And if not treated in a timely manner, that can leave patients with undesirable outcomes, such as disability and even death. This slide outlines the infected causes of fever. As you can see, from head to toe, every organ system can be involved. After doing a detailed system review, we should also explore travel history because certain pathogens can be epidemic in some parts of the world, for example, malaria in tropical countries, scrub typhus in the Asia Pacific region. Regarding exposure history, some of the classical representation include prevalence of anthrax in farm workers and leptospirosis in sewage workers. If you suspect zoonotic pathogens, you should ask about animal contact in a variety of settings. It may be through their occupation, or sometimes the animal may be their pets. Sexual history should be obtained, especially if you are considering sexually transmitted diseases as a differential. This diagram illustrates the overview of causes of fever. In addition to asking the cardinal symptoms of all the systems and examining CNS, respiratory, GI, and nitrogenoid systems, we should look for any lymphatic neuropathy, which can mean reactive changes caused by infection or infiltrative processes 
such as malignancy. You have to check the consistency of the limb nodes. You have to check if there is any tenderness. You have to check the uh, representation of the limb nodes. Uh, for example, somebody with infected food ulcers, they may have enlarged inguinal lymph nodes, or sometimes they may be quite generalized in their representation. You have to look for skin lesions as well, such as hepatico, scotted skin syndrome, viral exanthem, or hepatic brush. Sometimes there may be non infected causes as well, such as butterfly mellow rash of SLE and drug induced fever. That brings me to briefly discuss about medication associated fever. You can see a list of medications known to be associated with fever. Drug fever is often a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to ask about the suspected medication uh, when it was started and see if there is any correlation between the time causes of medication being started and onset of fever. Drug fever can be associated with a rash. Blood test may show eosinophilia. The average Hasheimer reaction is observed in patients being treated with antibiotics for syphilis, brucellosis, Lyme disease, and enteric fever, especially within the first 24 hours. And it is usually accompanied by other features such as rash and hypotension. Out of all the questions that we can ask about fever, pattern and grade of fever can often be quite useful, especially if you can plot that information down in a chart, like the examples that we have here. Not always, but sometimes, we may come across the classical textbook picture of step ledger fever of typhoid, or the Tashin fever of Plasmodium falciparum, or the Quartan fever of Plasmodium malariae. The presence of chills and rigor can mean the presence of microbes or toxin produced by them in the bloodstream and are often part of the symptoms caused by urinary tract infections or biliary sepsis or sometimes malaria. To sum up, when you are approaching a patient with fever, you have to ask about fever and do thyroid clinical assessment of all organ systems and see if there is any localization. We have to consider infection as the very first differential and do everything we can to rule out infection. If you can remove the infection from the equation, and then we come to a broad list of differentials, including inflammatory conditions, autoimmune diseases, medications, cancer, and metabolic pathologies. And last but not least, you have to explore the complications of fever as well. This is a brief touch on paraxial anal origin. Usually it means the uh, clinical, initial clinical assessment and investigations cannot pin down the diagnosis of condition responsible for fever. Often it tends to be associated with deep-seated infections, which are often challenging to observe clinically or organisms that are difficult to grow in traditional culture media or autoimmune conditions with non-specific systemic symptoms or cancers. The purpose of this presentation is to guide your thinking process when you encounter a patient with fever. This presentation is not meant to be a tool that you use to diagnose your patients. You will need to exercise your own clinical judgment and consider the clinical context of your patient's presentation in order to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. I hope this presentation should help you with an approach to a febrile patient in a systematic and clinically sound manner.
Thank you very much for listening.